Hello everyone and welcome back to the damage report as we greet a logo that's persistent over my face and a president that's now mobile and is totally healed and feeling good and everything's back to normal and we're not living out a weird version of The Walking Dead at all. Um, so we're gonna cover the news of which there's a lot, including the president's um, you know, emergence from Walter Reed, his return to the White House to spread the virus there, uh, very exciting. We've got a lot of other news too, but most importantly of all, we have Jordan Yule. How's it going, Jordan? Uh, John, it's going all right, thank you for having me. Good to have you here. Uh, I know over the weekend, you were doing a sort of fundraising effort, right? Uh, not a fundraiser, I'm working on a fundraiser uh, that hasn't been announced yet. Uh, but did do an Among Us stream uh, with Move On with a bunch of different uh, progressive partners and allies. Oh, I thought that was a fundraiser. I apologize. No, Move On's getting into okay. Twitch. That's fun and that's awesome. And I know that that game has absolutely exploded. It's uh, the latest thing in a long list of things that I'm just missing that's out there and everybody's having fun with. I need to figure out what's going on with that. Um, but anyway, we're we're very excited to have you here. You chose a good day to be on the show because there's a lot of wild news out there. I don't know if you if you if you've been on Twitter lately. There's a lot going on. I go on there. Anyway, sometimes. you do every once in a while. I've I've seen. So if um if you're watching this right now, whether you're on YouTube or Twitch or literally anywhere, um you're gonna want to hit that like button, or maybe there's a heart, or there's bits or something. There's a lot of stuff. I don't know. Um, but anyway, you're gonna want people to know that we're active because it's gonna be pretty wild. And uh, if you send us in messages, uh, you know, chats and tweets and super chats and things like that, we will be responding as we go. But with that said, there's so much to get to. So uh, Jordan, why don't we jump right into it? Donald Trump was not gonna stay at Walter Reed any longer than necessary or even as long as necessary. And so as was alluded to over the weekend, and as we talked about on the show yesterday, he did leave and he returned to the White House where he decided to have his first action back in the White House be very emblematic of his overall approach to the pandemic that continues to grip our nation. Take a look. Okay, so we're gonna have a little bit of a zoom in on a few seconds of that video, but Jordan, um, so he returned to the White House and immediately took his mask off. First thing he did as president once again, what do you think? Uh, it's it's hard to really encapsulate just how reckless like him and his team and his supporters are being in this moment. Like this is this is a virus that you know has killed over a million people worldwide. It's killed two hundred thousand plus in the states. Um, you know, millions of people have had it, and if you know, just like I do, people who have had this, it is it's miserable, and we've seen how contagious it is. And that this was, you know, it seems like we can get into this, but it seems like you know a rushed exit from Walter Reed and yeah. taking the mask off, and then again, like supporters, which I think we'll get into later, turning this into like the next step in that like mask culture war, just shows like they this does they, they don't care, they really do not care. No, they, they freely don't seem to, or at the very least he doesn't. I'm sure there's somebody hypothetically that wants Trump to do what is good for him, whether in terms of his health, in terms of his prospects of reelection, but Trump is gonna be Trump. So he's not gonna listen to any of that. Um, but but really fast, let's, let's talk about the, the mask going off. Um, because the president at that point was near an official photographer and other staffers could be seen behind him. He didn't put his mask back on as he turned to walk back into the White House. So look, if he just wanted to walk up those stairs um, and then take his mask off to weirdly look out at the crowd. Okay, I get it. This is supposed to reassure his fans that he's still alive and his face hasn't melted off, you know, Indiana Jones style. But then once you go to go back into the White House, put your mask back on, but he didn't do that. And if you take a look at this photo, which is from a higher vantage point, you can see, he is walking into a room with people in it, 
as he is shedding coronavirus freely into the air around him. He is not totally cured, there hasn't been enough time for that. This isn't like it's unsafe for anyone to not have a mask on or it's even more unsafe because you were around someone that might have had it and maybe you have it. No, we know he has coronavirus right then and he's walking to the White House with a mask off to just shed it into the air for those people. I just don't, I know that we're we're lefties, so you know, like bleeding hearts, ah, oh, we don't want to kill people. We're so weak in that respect. But I don't understand a person like those aren't his political enemies. It's not like Adam Schiff is in there, or like, you know, Kelly and Conway's husband, or like the Lincoln Project guys. Those <laughs> are his fans that have stuck with him to this point that still work for him, and he's doing what he can to kill them. Right. I, um, you know, I saw a story last night about how housekeeping staff are starting to contract it in the White House now because of this kind of like disregard for human life that he and his staff have demonstrated. And we saw this kind of play out in the debate when he took a shot at Hunter Biden for his 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 history with with drug abuse. And you know, Hunter's much more privileged than the average drug user, less likely to face any real like Substantive consequences than someone who grew up in like the Rust Belt who got addicted to heroin stuff like that. Like, but the fact that he like thought that that on national TV during the debate was the time to attack this guy for his own shortcomings um, was just another instance of that. We're seeing so like for whether it's attacking uh, someone's kid for for mistakes that they've made or now infecting staff in the in the White House around him or on his campaign team. And just taking off a mask, knowing deep down he has to know he still has this. It's just a complete and total disregard for human life. It's just absolutely callous. It just totally is. And um, you know, I, I would say this is one of the lives he's risking that I care the least about. But it's also a risk to his own life. Um, just hours before what you saw in that video, White House physician, physician Sean Conley said Trump quote may not be entirely out of the woods yet with the virus. The president is still infected and will continue to receive treatment at the White House. He just doesn't want to do it at Walter Reed because I guess it, he thinks it makes him look weak. And if you're a right wing male, there's literally nothing you fear more than someone thinking you're weak. Even if your lifelong quest to avoid that appearance makes you constantly weak. But that's a longer conversation we don't have time to get into. Now, White House aides have advised President Trump to avoid the Oval Office while he's still infected. We'll see if he respects that. But they're making arrangements for him to work out of the diplomatic reception room and use it as a backdrop for future televised remarks, according to two White House officials. Now, one of those White House officials told Axios, it's insane that he would return to the White House and jeopardize his staff's health when we are still learning of new cases among senior staff. This place is a cesspool. And they go on to say, he was so concerned with preventing embarrassing stories that he exposed thousands of his own staff and supporters to a deadly virus. He has kept us in the dark and now our spouses and kids have to pay the price. It's just selfish. So look, my my gut reaction is, why are you still saying all this stuff off the record? But the thing is, we saw that um, that Pence aide come out and you know give all this information about what was happening in the White House. And it's not like going on the record makes his followers care anymore. But Jordan, this is this is what people who actually work there are saying. Like they are shocked that he is willing to do this and to infect, as you said, not just you know the the politicos in the White House, but the people who are just working there, the the staff. Yeah, I I, I don't know. I I I can't believe. Here I am, like still somehow shocked that like this is what what it's reached. That they all know that this could get people killed around them. They can get people sick. Um, you know, if if they don't have, uh, you know, or 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 those people in the st- staff, like maybe in housekeeping, don't have uh, their family members don't have health insurance, people around them don't have health insurance, they could risk like bankruptcy. This is this is extremely dangerous, and he is using this as a campaign prop because he wants to be seen, like you said, uh, as this kind of alpha male. He he doesn't want to be seen as weak or inferior. You know, it's it's really close to the election, so he wants to make sure like people aren't worried. Uh, about his like you know his vitality or, or or election prospects, yeah. And the end result is he's putting people's lives in the line. That is that is so unbelievably callous. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And um, you know it's it's 
Trump is obviously putting at risk the lives of everyone around him. But let's focus just briefly on the fact that he's probably also endangering his own life too. So he spent a few days at Walter Reed. You know, and he received arguably the best care one could get. It seems like in some ways he got the doctors to give him things that he probably shouldn't have. But so what condition is he in though? Because now he's left, he doesn't wanna be there anymore, he's left. So many people noticed that in that video last night, he didn't necessarily look like he was totally cured. Take a look at this. So, um, you know, we, we can play that as B-roll, but Jordan, that, that was going around and a lot of people were saying that doesn't look like a person who is breathing totally unencumbered and just totally happy to be, you know, processing oxygen. That doesn't seem like that. Right, and this is a virus that could like cause permanent lung damage uh, to someone that it infects. I've got a buddy who had it in March and uh, he's been telling me a lot about like his experience with it because he had it for around 20 days. And he said, like the first few days, you kind of feel sick, you kind of feel all right, but like it kind of ebbs and flows from then on. And we saw the path with with Herman Cain, like they thought he was on yeah. the mend about a week, ten days into it, and then ultimately his his you know fate took a turn for the worse. Um, again, my buddy said that kind of breathing thing resembles what he had experienced. Even like fifteen days in, he thought he was feeling better. Went for a short bike ride and thought he was gonna like his lungs were going to explode because he couldn't he couldn't oh. breathe. Um, this is kind of par for the course for what people who've had it uh, say it's like. And this again, this is the onset. This is the beginning. Like this this is not going away anytime soon. Yeah, it doesn't look at it. I mean, look, I've said you know every day that we've had a show since he was infected, I have said that I am sure for a number of reasons that he's going to be just fine. He is definitely receiving whatever humanity has to keep a 74 year old man with comorbidities alive during this. He is going to get it. He is gonna get it earlier than anyone else would get it. He's gonna get it for free. I have a feeling he is going to be just fine. When I say just fine, I mean that he'll be alive. Um, whether he is setting himself up for a lifelong lung or other organ damage, I don't know. But um, but I was reading, um, I think it was Dr. Syed was saying that one of the things you look for in terms in terms of evaluating someone's recovery here in terms of the breathing is the involvement of these muscles. Like how much are you having to sort of do that to aid in the breathing process? And you can see that in that video. He appears to be wincing, but he wanted to go home. He wanted to go home and show how happy you can see that. Look at that, that like pained. And I'm not like, I know uh, some conservative watching this would be like, why are they like taking pleasure? I'm not taking pleasure in this. This is a bad, bad, stupid idea. It's a stupid, stupid, stupid idea that seems to be done because of either his bizarre personality weaknesses or a belief that it'll help him in the election. And I don't even think that that's true. Um, this just whole thing is just. It's sad. Initially, I know there were the memes and there were gifts, but that was very funny. But it's just getting sad. This isn't good for anyone, and lives are on the line. His, and more importantly, other people around him. Yeah. This. No. Um, oh, uh, yeah. Just briefly, it just like the 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 response from his supporters and lackeys was really alarming too. Like his campaign put out like a, a gif or a meme of uh, him. His head had been like motion tracked onto a football player, and he was like hurtling over COVID. You saw the tweets from like uh, Kelly Loeffler uh, mm -hmm. saying Trump beat COVID and leaning into this kind of like he beat it, <clears throat> he toughened it, uh, he was tougher than it, that kind of stuff. That rhetoric, I really, I, I gotta imagine, is going to backfire with most people because people around us, like who have gotten sick or, or died from it, like it's no fault of their own. It wasn't that they weren't tough enough, it's that this is really dangerous. And leaning yeah. into this kind of like hyper masculine, like tougher than the virus rhetoric is just, is so short sighted. Yeah, yeah, I would say hyper fake masculine, but but I get right. I, I agree. Right. And we're gonna we're gonna get exactly what you're saying there. We're gonna get out of Trump's mouth, and a little bit later on, we're gonna um we're gonna check in on Fox News and see how they're dealing with all of this. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom, 
In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Donald Trump's uh, return to the White House where he took off his mask and all of that seems to have been designed to produce a few videos of a fairly obvious propagandistic style. Uh, the first was a direct address to the country. And in this, I think he's like he's always been irresponsible when it comes to the pandemic, but this might be the worst he's ever been in that regard. Here is the first bit of what he had to say. I just left Walter Reed Medical Center. And it's really something very special. The doctors, the nurses, the first responders. And I learned so much about coronavirus. And one thing that's for certain, don't let it dominate you. Don't be afraid of it. You're gonna beat it. We have the best medical equipment. We have the best medicines, all developed recently. And you're gonna beat it. I went, I didn't feel so good. And two days ago, I could have left two days ago. Two days ago, I felt great, like better than I have in a long time. I said just recently, better than 20 years ago. Don't let it dominate. Don't let it take over your life. Okay, so there's gonna be more, unfortunately. But Jordan, what do you think? This is, this is what he's learned. He's an expert now. Yeah, the suggestion that uh, he's somehow like immune to it is just absolutely like bizarre. Um, and, and, and reckless to reiterate on our, our, our conversation earlier. Uh, that's just, it's a scientific, it's, just, it's, it's completely bogus. Um, but that him and his team and staff would put that out uh, is, is really alarming. Um, but you know, again, they're putting lives on the line with this kind of stuff. They haven't really shown an interest in caring about this uh, from the jump. They wanted to downplay this as we've seen from uh, late reporting from, from Bob Woodward's book. Uh, but Yep. They don't yep. care. Uh, it's um, it, uh, people want to say like, oh, imagine if uh, another country's leader did this, if another dictator uh, did this, and it's just like, what's well, happening here? Like, we don't need to like draw <laughs> comparisons to like North Korea or China. Like, it's happening here right now. Yeah. Um, and this is like you know a talking point that the right likes to draw uh, you know distinctions or parallels to whenever a Democrat does something like, oh, this is just like North Korea or you know communist. Uh, Russia um, or you the USSR, but no, here you go. It's happening right now. You have this like absolute kayfabe video uh, that they produced and, and released yesterday. It's so yeah. sensational. It, 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 the guy's clearly not doing well, as we saw with like the zoomed in no. video. It's really, it's He's a really odd, hard. odd moment. Yeah. Oh God. And um, yeah, I, we could focus on any three random words there. I'll restrain myself to just a few. Um, <laughs> Don't let it dominate you. Don't like live in fear or whatever he said. You like, we have language restrictions that stop me from expressing what I'm really thinking about Donald Trump right now. Um, my relative who died from this wasn't letting it dominate him. No, he had a fatal illness that killed him, okay? That's how that works. And the people who wear masks are not letting it dominate them. They're being responsible in protecting their own life and the lives of people around them. That's the scary part and and I don't wanna focus too much on it or I don't need to focus too much on it because he is going to say some version of this a thousand times between now and the election and Fox News will be saying it as we're gonna get to in a little bit. So we'll move on when he says I may be immune to it now. Okay, so we can have a conversation about 
the the strength of the evidence right now about how antibodies work in regards to coronavirus and whether you actually develop immunity and whether it's short term, it's long term. That's an interesting conversation for another day. You've got it now, you colossal moron. You have it in your system. Your lungs are filled up with COVID. What do you mean immune? You're breathing it at the camera right now. If we had some sort of lens that made germs visible, it would be clouding the view of your face. You have coronavirus, you colossal fool. Ah, okay, here's the second part, a little bit more of him. We have the greatest country in the world. We're going back, we're going back to work, we're gonna be out front. As your leader, I had to do that. I knew there's danger to it, but I had to do it. I stood out front, I led. Nobody that's a leader would not do what I did. And I know there's a risk, there's a danger, but that's okay. And now I'm better and maybe I'm immune, I don't know. Oh my God, anyway, um, okay, so th that, that's enough of that. Jordan, he's now like, this is not a hypothetical anymore as to whether he'll have a new tone or something after having COVID. No, he's saying, um, I got over it, now everybody needs to get back to work. I got over it, so that's proof that you all need to do it. And everything he did that put him at risk of getting it, and he did end up getting it, was just anything any leader would do. Any leader would hold indoor rallies, wouldn't wear a mask, would tell other people not to wear the masks, would mock people for wearing masks. They're presenting all of that as just that's leadership. There was no other way to act. Yeah, um, <clears throat> just he got over it, so you should too. Just take your private helicopter. Uh, to your private ward in the hospital where you're gonna have doctors wait on you hand and foot for free uh, and give you the best treatment you could possibly get. Everyone should just do that. It's that it's really it's really quite simple. Um, if if everyone did that, then I think we could eradicate the virus collectively tomorrow. So get out there, get back to work. Um, you know, who cares? Who cares about the people who get sick? Who cares about the people who die? Uh, this is the right wing mentality. Like they it's the, the the economy first. It's like a it's a it's a death cult. Um, at the end of the day, it's about preserving the markets, preserving their investments, preserving their control. Mm -hmm. um, they don't care. They don't care if people get sick or die. Uh, it is, it's, it's a necessary uh, evil, I guess. But you've seen comments from Ron Johnson at the very beginning. It's like, yeah, sure, 3% of the infected patients might die. That's just a sacrifice we have to make. Well, now he has it. Does he still feel that way? Yeah. Yeah, well, and I'm so glad that you pointed that out. Chris Christie said when they were pushing for reopening, some people will just have to die. Well, now Chris Christie has it. Um, hopefully he's doing well, God only knows. This is a very deadly virus, but yeah, it was all those pastors you know, initially when it was spreading around saying, we're not gonna stop, we gotta persevere through this and still have services. And so many of them got sick, like this is not, it's not working in mysterious ways. It's working in very obvious, predictable ways. Predictable to a rational person who respects science. So one other area where in theory, Donald Trump could have shown that he had learned something from the experience of his ongoing recovery from COVID would be to change the way that he talks about this a little bit. Um, but he's not interested in doing that. And I mean that very, very literally, it's like the exact same messaging and we have a great example of it. So he sent out a tweet that has since been sort of kind of redacted by Twitter, but it's still available there because Twitter won't actually get rid of these tweets. They'll just put up a warning. So he tweeted, flu season is coming up. Many people every year, sometimes over 100,000, and despite the vaccine, die from the flu. Random, if you're listening to this on the podcast, random words are capitalized, I don't know why. Are we going to close down our capital country? No. We have learned to live with it, just like we are learning to live with COVID in most populations, far less lethal. So at the beginning of this, March 9th, back before any of the lockdowns, before anything, I was still shooting in the studio. He tweeted, so last year, 37,000 Americans died from the common flu. It averages between 27,000 and 70,000 per year. Nothing is shut down, life and the economy go on. At this moment, there are 546 confirmed cases of coronavirus with 22 deaths. Think about that. I'm gonna turn that back on you, uh, you think about that. There were 22 deaths then, uh, we've got a, about a thousand times as many deaths now. And he's still saying the same thing. I mean, he's artificially inflated how many people supposedly die each year from the flu to sort of make it keep up a bit with COVID. It's not true, 100,000 people don't die every year, that's not even remotely true. 61,000 I think is the most in the past decade that have died. 
Um, but Jordan, he's it's the same exact talking points, actually the same. Yeah, and they've, they've learned nothing. They're just they're trying the same the same type of tactics because they really want to make this seem like it's as insignificant as they can because they've got an election coming up and he wants to you know he wants to <laughs> somehow. Twist what has happened over the past several months into some sort of victory. They're, they are desperate. They are really, really hurting. You know, I don't want to rely on polls because it's very easy to just respond and say, yeah, I'm voting for X candidate. It's much different to wait in line for a few hours and actually cast your ballot. So I don't want to get too confident in the polls, but it is looking like Trump is headed for a loss, hopefully. So they are, they are just, you know, swing for the fences, trying to do anything they can. Uh, and and just they are so desperate in this moment, and yeah. that means even going back to old, completely bogus talking points about the flu. Um, the, maybe the flu will be diminished this year because people are already socially distancing. But forcing things to reopen only guarantees that that get worse. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up because that's that. Uh, there was something we were going to talk about later, but I but I do want to move it up here really fast. I do want to uh, mention someone corrected me in the Twitch. My math was bad. Um, we don't have a thousand times as many deaths. We have ten thousand times as many deaths as we had when he sent that for ten thousand times as many deaths. But it's fine. Don't don't let it dominate you. Don't let it like totally take over your life. Um, yeah. So uh, let let's talk about this very briefly. Um, I know when he announced that he had gotten COVID, there were some people who th- who I think naturally questioned. Can we trust anything they're saying, including something that looks like bad news? Is it possible that this is just an attempt to distract the electorate? I mean, obviously there was the tax story. Nobody cares about that anymore, that he committed tax fraud and doesn't pay taxes apparently. This would be a distraction from that. It would be an October surprise. It could change things up. But I mean, and look, obviously he has it. So, but their attempt to use this to change the conversation, Jordan, does it seem like that would help? Like, is a hyper focus on coronavirus now in the three to four weeks we have until the election? What do you think about that? Because I know you said we've got the polls, but obviously we don't want complacency and we're not just gonna trust any poll, you know, you know, without being critical of it. What do you think about this turn to focusing on coronavirus as supposedly a positive thing for Donald Trump? I <laughs> You know, wouldn't be their first mistake. Um, it just seems it seems like a, a series of rash, uh, odd decisions from this campaign. Um, you know, uh, money. We uh, we you, uh, some friends and I talked about yesterday. Uh, just the money moving out of key states and reinvestments in Florida um, mm-hmm. it, it, with ad buys. It's just like what I don't understand. Florida Florida is supposed to be a lock for Trump. Either that is a weird decision. Or they're doubling down because they really are struggling. Um, you know, uh, we'll see. Forcing this debate seems to be like another odd decision uh, because it just it sets him up for these types of conversations where he's going to have to justify uh, everything he's done on this issue and even got it. Turning this into oh, you can't even talk about it because you didn't have it, like a like a like a survivor narrative. <laughs> Uh, the past 72 hours, their decisions have been really, really bizarre. Yeah, that, yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned the spending because um, he's he's putting more money into Florida, which is he he has to win Florida. Like it's not it's not oh if he gets Florida he's he's good like Bush in 2000. No, he has to win it and then do other things. So he's putting money into Florida. Trump is off the air in Ohio and Iowa. Which could mean that he has internal polling that shows that it's so a win for him that he doesn't need it. But that's not what I'm seeing. That seems like surrender. And so think about, let's just talk about two states. He's putting money into Florida, Biden is putting money into Texas. That doesn't seem like, I know, don't get complacent. And remember, it's feeling like this election is probably not going to come down to the votes anyway. But yeah. I don't know. And I will say, like if I was Trump, I would want to be talking about literally anything other than the pandemic as a potential third wave starts to ramp up. Him, like we already know from all the polling, people think he got it because he was irresponsible. Like it, it maybe there will be some sympathy anyway, but it's not like we feel so bad that he got it despite his best efforts. So now we're more, you know, like we, we we're on his side. That's not that's not happening. More and more people are dying. How could this possibly be 
a good turn for them. They need to be talking about the economy or whatever. And even then it would just be the stock market. It wouldn't be reflective of actual people's lives, but that would be something at least. But COVID, why would that be the thing? Why would that be the thing? Yeah, anyway, I mean, um, really, no, no, continue. I, I feel like they kind of, they just wasted an opportunity to like garner sympathy. Uh, in that immediate moment with his diagnosis and going to the hospital, you saw almost a bipartisan consensus like, oh, we need to be respectful and mindful. Uh -huh. You saw people who deeply uh -huh. detest this guy and various MSNBC hosts, personalities who don't like him going out of their way to express their sympathy for him. Uh, you know, various Democratic elected officials, same thing. And then, like 48 hours later, he rushes out of the hospital and takes off his mask. Could have milked that for like four or five days and created this kind of rally around the uh, the president effect that we see in polls during times of national tragedy or mourning. Um, like that could have been you know a strategy, but instead it's hey I'm going back out there I'm doubling down I'm taking off my mask. You're not tough enough if you if this killed you. But like, yeah. I'll never understand. I will never understand this. So it's like has there ever been a clear example of insult to injury from the president so i didn't give a damn if your relatives or friends died so hundreds of thousands of them have and now i'm going to imply that they did it because they just didn't have the right stuff okay okay a lot of people know someone who died from covid i can't imagine anyone liked trump's comment there So Trump has made his triumphant return to the White House and it seems now like the entire thing was designed to produce this video. Okay, so um, you know, I know if you're on the podcast again, you might be confused and think from the epic music that that was a trailer for the next Avengers, um, but that was a video of a sick old man being driven home from the hospital that he insisted he be discharged from, even though he still has an active infection in his system. It was cool music, I'll give you that, but it was just an old sick man being driven home against his doctor's wishes. What do you think, Jordan? I mean, I, I don't think anything has ever been more propaganda than this was propaganda. Oh, yeah, this is unbelievable! Like unbelievable. I, I couldn't believe this when I saw it. Uh, and had this is what I was referring to earlier with kind of the kayfabe video. It's just like super sensational. Uh, this is unbelievably fascist. Like this is just like the the monuments, the the White House, the pageantry mm -hmm. of state, all of this kind of stuff. Uh, like you said. To show a, a sick guy coming back home, like that is like it's so over the top. <laughs> like it, it, it's it's hilarious. Like I don't want to laugh at the guy's condition uh, because you know it, it's it's an unfortunate uh, virus, and it's you know you don't want to see more people get sick and die. But like this video is hilarious because it's just like it's so over the top. Yeah, and the the fact that again. He got it because he told doctors to go F themselves month after month after month, refused to do even the most simple precautions against getting it. So he stupidly bumbled into getting it. And now like he's Captain America because of that. Like, you know, I hope he gets better. Hope he hope he recovers. And more importantly, I hope that he doesn't spread it to even more people than he already has. But you're not a superhero, bro. You're an old sick guy who got driven home from the hospital. Um, and this is one of the things, I think we talked about this on the show yesterday. It's one of the things about letting Trump become president that now he gets to make videos like that. Like, I don't know how much that cost us as taxpayers to produce that. Like, why didn't he just drive home in a car? Why did they medevac him? Well, because it's a cooler video. They had to do the helicopter because it's cool. So they did all of that stuff, potentially infecting more people, 
so that he can make a video that'll get you know 30,000 retweets or something like that. Like as Jordan says, it is both incredibly fascistic, the you know the veneration of military technology and stuff like that. But it's also us that made it, like we paid for that. And I don't think I got my money's worth, honestly, I don't. <laughs> no, I mean, and also it's like setting themselves up to fail. Like they are setting like, they're coming out really, really hot out of the gate with like, oh, the Trump beat COVID stuff. Like, oh wow, look at him, am I immune to it? And now this video, like all of these types of things could backfire because like as we talked about earlier, your condition kind of varies from day to day, especially over like a couple weeks. This isn't gone. Um, yeah, sure, he's gonna get good care, but like he is old and he has other ailments that could that is like you know disproportionately impacted by this kind of virus. Um, uh, like I said, a buddy of mine felt fine like one week, and then the next week he felt like he was climbing a mountain just going to his his mailbox, coughing yeah. up blood and stuff. So like, there's a lot of other risks. Um, that could have adverse reactions or impacts. And they're setting themselves up for failure with this kind of stuff really, really hot out of the gate. Yeah, I mean that you 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 nailed it. That am I immune? I don't know. Like God help him if if he takes a turn for the worse. And the videos of him, like you mentioned the football one, but there's the one of him like in the WWE tackling someone who has COVID put <laughs> as their face. Sort of like works on two levels because you should probably stay away from the COVID, but he actually runs to it and tackles it, so it really does work. Um, but that's not, and that was Kelly Loeffler. Like he's not out of the woods. I again, I think I've said it for a thousand times. Um, I think he's going to end up being fine, or at least he'll live. But that's not. Don't don't knock on wood, man. People take a turn for the worse. My relative had good days and had bad days during the treatment, and then eventually passed away as a result of it. Why are you tempting fate anyway? Okay, but let's turn to the next angle of this because Trump is gonna do what Trump is gonna do. But I do care about what the media does. Uh, Donald Trump's battle against COVID, which continues, he seems to think he's done with it, but he's not, is being spun by the media as like game over, we're good now. Whether on our dealing with the economy, the, with the COVID in the economy or on the election. Um, I, I was initially going to pull a bunch of video clips of this, but I don't want to subject you to Sean Hannity or Tucker Carlson on a day like this. So I will simply use the awesome resource that is Media Matters and show you a little bit of what they've been saying lately. Uh, Tucker Carlson says that Trump leaving Walter Reed proves coronavirus isn't quite as scary as they're telling you it is. What does that mean? He's still sick and hundreds of thousands of people didn't leave the hospital. Like. I get that he gets paid $20 million a year or whatever, and he has a camera pointed at his face. But that's the stupidest thing I think I've ever heard in my life. Why? What is what is the point of that? Like his viewers who know someone who died of COVID, what are they supposed to be like? Oh, good point. I guess my friend overreacted when they, they passed away as a result of COVID mangling their lungs and leaving them incapable of processing oxygen. They were really a snowflake about that. I see that now. Jordan, what's the, what's the, why? Like what is it? Is it just for people who don't know anyone? Is it just for the people who've been totally insulated against this thing? I mean, maybe it's that he hasn't been directly impacted. Maybe it's that they just, yeah. You know, I, I think Fox also has had a, 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 I don't know if it's implicit or you know as overt, but they have they've had a um, a coordinated messaging uh, on this from the beginning. And Media Matters did a great yeah. job uh, just uh, demonstrating this, like from from the start. Oh, hey, this is fine. Don't worry. About it. Don't even worry about it. Oh, hey, it's like t it's ten deaths. Oh, you know, it's two hundred deaths. It's fine. Uh, we had to protect the market, and just every step of the way, they had a new response. And now, when it finally reaches the president, it's oh, he's fine. Look, it's fine. He he got out of the hospital in two days. It, and here's the thing: Tucker knows that that is not the case. He is lying. He is he is he is lying about this. He knows deep down that Trump's case and Trump's treatment, especially is completely unique compared to any other person. And he yeah. knows that deep down and he is misleading his viewers and is one of the most watched cable news shows in the country. That is extremely dangerous because people are going to believe that people are really impressionable, especially when they get all of their news from TV. Like that is that is extremely dangerous and his supporters, Trump supporters and loyalists buy that. Like the the fanfare outside the hospital. If you heard the audio clips, people screaming, "I will die for that man." Yeah. Get help, please. I, I assure you there are more important things in this world to die for.
Like that is that is so <laughs> alarming to have that kind of like just completely one sided relationship with a guy who doesn't even care about you. And that yeah. Tucker is enabling that and feeling that just shows what a vile, despicable person he is. Yeah, you know, we, we didn't we didn't end up using that video because I, I just I hope that that's a troll, like that that's just someone <laughs> pretending. But 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 yeah. whether it is or not, we know that there are millions of Americans that do actually feel that way. That they might not necessarily be willing to die for him, although their attitude toward masks imply that they are. But they're certainly willing to hypothetically kill for him the way that they talk about a civil war if he doesn't win the election. Yeah. But anyway, uh, that was Tucker Carlson. We also have Tucker Carlson uh, saying, at some point, we're all going to die. Is that is that how he views like the threat of uh, Muslim extremists coming over the border or any like literally any other threat? Is his attitude? Well, what are you gonna do? We're all gonna die someday. Is that how he views any of those? Oh no, he doesn't view any other threat that way. Just this one. Interesting. And and he's finally come full circle because I remember in the initial month or so of the pandemic. There was that study of Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson and how Tucker Carlson supposedly was more responsible with the way that he talked about it. He immediately jumped off a cliff into irresponsibility right after that. But one of the things that Sean Hannity said in the first couple of weeks of the lockdown on his radio show was, what are you gonna do, we're all gonna die. Well now 210,000 plus Americans have been reported as dead. And Tucker Carlson apparently after all of that, after everything we've been through together, all of these shows, all this news, all that stuff. Yeah, just yeah, at some point we're all gonna die. That's it. It's just fatalism. They're pretending that it's like brave or alpha or tough or leadership. It is simply fatalistic surrender in the face of something that we know how to defeat, that we have the resources to defeat, but that they just don't actually care to fight because they think somehow that surrendering to it, dying from it is better for Donald Trump. A sad I mean, country. Yeah, this they are again, this messaging is so hollow because inside Fox, they're practicing social distancing. A lot of them are working from home. Yeah. Tucker has been filming from home or doing the show from home or remote locations, things like that. They are they're not living to the same standard that they talk about on the show. They're they don't have this callous disregard in the office. They're treating it like everyone else should be treating it, like which is with preventative measures. And it's like this is an issue of like it's in it's impacting him. It's inconveniencing him. He can't go to the Palm Steakhouse every night like he likes to. Mm -hmm. uh, he can't, you know, he can't just travel freely. He can't go on vacations, trout fishing or whatever. Things like he likes to do. Um, you know, even from like the the, the small things, like he is a he's a big fisher guy, a fisherman. So he threw he had a segment on his show when he heard there was like litter in one of his favorite fishing spots, and he blamed it on immigrants. And he blames it on like a marginalized community. Um, it's just like when things impact him, he cares, and that's why he he's mm. like upset about this. He doesn't care if you die as a result. He just wants things to oh go my. back to normal for him. But Skip, what are you doing with that? <laughs> what are you doing, Skip? <laughs> Come on. I guess Skip's got to have fun too. Um, you know that's actually interesting. I didn't know that he was really into fishing, I thought it was like a wink and a nod joke that he'll go on a fishing trip every time it's revealed that one of his employees is a literal Nazi or he's accused of sexual misconduct. I didn't think he was actually going fishing, but apparently he is. Oh yeah, he yeah he actually is. Oh. Uh, there's even a video of him back in like uh, early 2010s, I think, of him fishing in Central Park. Um, some bystander just saw him there. I guess they like artificially like put fish in like a pond or a lake in Central Park, and he was fishing there. Like he he legitimately I is. I don't a mind that. Fisherman. Yeah, assuming you're allowed to. Although I wouldn't doubt that he would do it even if you weren't allowed to. But anyway, um, okay. So he's ridiculous. But let's move on to slightly more ridiculous. Not necessarily all the way to Lou Dobbs' hero worship of Donald Trump, but Sean Hannity compared Donald Trump's COVID infection to Winston Churchill's response to World War II, and I hate every word of that. Nothing like that. The the interesting thing about Winston Churchill's response to World War II is that Winston Churchill responded to World War II. Trump just surrendered to the virus six months ago, and that's it. And now he's telling you that you should have a herd mentality. I, that doesn't scream of Winston Churchill. There's a vague resemblance between the two, but beyond that, the metaphor is weak, Sean. It's really weak. 
Yeah, who could forget that like that that heroic moment when Winston Churchill like quietly told a reporter they're gonna downplay the threat of the Nazis. Like just like, oh, we'll just it's not that big of a deal. We don't want to turn this into a thing. Yeah. I just wanted to project a positive attitude. <laughs> yeah, no, that would be yeah. like if it would be like if the blitz was going on and there's like one neighborhood that man, it's getting bombed. It's just really getting bombed. And everyone's like, Winston, don't go in there, Winston, you moron, don't go in there. And he's like, no, nah, I got this, I'm good. And he walks in there and gets his legs blown off. That would be a little bit like this, like that he's not listening to the advice of the people that know better than he does. God, anyway, I'm having a little bit of trouble with my mic. I'm gonna proceed though. So anyway, look, I, I summarize this just to say, and, and we don't know, Lou Dobbs tonight is going to say some insane things um, about Trump being released. But you should understand that while very few of our fans probably watch much Fox News, they do think, or at least want their old fans to think, that Trump, you know, insisting that he get discharged while he's still actively fighting the COVID infection is like, it's over, it's done. He is a hero on the level of Alexander the Great or whatever. I don't know, we live we live in very different worlds. That's all I have to say about that. Um, you wanna move to someone arguably worse though, Jordan? Sure, John. This is someone that we have not talked about on this show, I don't think, in months. Because I genuinely don't get any pleasure out of it, but we're going to here. So Donald Trump got COVID. Joe Biden didn't, arguably because Joe Biden actively tries not to, um, for instance, by social distancing and by wearing a mask. And he continues to try to remind people of that, for instance, with this video that his campaign put out yesterday. Look that up online, the full video of just Joe Biden putting on the mask has like rock music and the entire thing makes me feel really uncomfortable. I guess you have to really love Joe Biden for that to be for you. But anyway, I agree with the message, it's a simple one. Wear a mask so you won't shed the virus and you'll protect yourself from getting it. For some people though, that video, nay, that request that you wear a mask is effeminate, including Tommy Lauren. Who tweeted, might as well carry a purse with that mask, Joe. And I hate it. I hate it so much. I hate everything. Not about like her. She's a grifting robot. Like she she's not a, you know, she doesn't exercise free will. She's just doing whatever she thinks will get her paid. But Jordan, like the fact that he Trump got coronavirus and they still think wearing a mask is something that little sissy boys do, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, this really goes back to kind of the hyper masculine stuff that we talked about earlier. Um, this The debate had that moment where Trump insulted Biden for wearing a mask. Oh, this guy wears the biggest mask I've ever seen. Immediately proceeds to catch COVID, uh, goes home, takes off the mask. And now it's you're somehow uh, less of a man, or or you know this this is kind of a, a hyper masculine trope here by by Tommy. But like, oh, you got to be carrying a purse if you wear a mask. Like, what what is that? Who does that serve? And it's 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 at some point like I have to wonder if this is all just an act. She can't be that dumb. Like, is she to get this far? I mean, she's she's successfully navigated right wing media circles and and different organizations for years. Like, she's not inept. I think she's just like really, really in the tank for the GOP. Like that's if that's your thing, like whatever. It's not what I would want to do. I want to make an honest living. But like she, she's just like clearly a a right wing reactionary who will do and say and whatever to defend the right wing. This is this is absurd. Yeah. She, I can't. I refuse to believe she's that dumb. She's just entirely disingenuous. I, I agree, and she is, you know, uh, we are living in Griff Nation. Everybody needs to understand it. There are true believers, like there are on the right. They're, they're crazy, insane, racist, all of that. But like they really do project that they really believe this. But I get from her that she does what all grifters do. She analyzes the landscape, identifies a desire. And just does the thing that those people want her to do. And so what those people want, and those people, by the way, are right wing white males. They want a woman who will tell them constantly that women are bad 
and certainly not as good as men. That's what these men want. They want men that will tell them that women suck, but they especially want women that will tell them that women suck. And so Tommy Lauren is doing the thing that Ann Coulter did for several decades. Just saying that women suck, they're awful, they're emotional, they shouldn't be in positions of leadership. They probably shouldn't even be able to vote. That's what she's doing here. She's sort of dipping her toe in the water, but she's saying women are weak. Being like a woman is weak and stupid. And so Joe Biden wearing a mask is weak like a woman's weak. Even though, important reminder, Trump got COVID and Biden didn't. That would seem to be a point in Biden's favor, but apparently not from Tommy Lauren because Tommy Lauren doesn't care that much about people getting COVID. She cares about having knuckle dragging white conservative males continue to watch her show. You know, and I could say more, I'm not going to, I'm gonna end it right there. There's more to it than just that, but that's what she wants. And 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 the reason that I show this really is not to point out to people that Tommy Lauren is, is a horrible grifter or whatever, everybody knows that. It's will anyone learn from Trump getting COVID? And I guess not if you're getting paid not to. You know, if, if you're getting paid to tell people that masks are a hoax thought up by China and you know Bill Gates, then no, I guess at this point you're probably not gonna learn and you're not gonna suddenly become responsible in this way. Yeah, and this this exemplifies this kind of this this trope that oh Trump uh, Trump beat COVID, he's tougher than COVID, all that kind of stuff. This is like this is you know the ultimate distillation of that. Like not only did he do it, he's a man uh, for not even wearing a mask. He's not even scared of it. Things like that. And you know she's well connected in in, in right wing media circles. She works at Fox, um, so this mm-hmm. is just like it shows. Just even there. Uh, from there to kind of like the fringes, like they're all. This is going. To, this is going to be their talking point now. Yeah, yeah. Really fast. I, I don't know. I, I've probably said this on the show before. So I've only had two interactions with Tommy Lauren really in my life. Maybe tweets or something like that. But I blocked that out. Um, she had me on her show way back, I think, on the Blaze, and it was a segment about Hillary Clinton. And all I got from that impression was that the man she really hates Hillary Clinton. But that was pretty much it. It was a short thing. I've only ever talked to her once in person, um, and we had a little conversation. And you know what she was like in person? Was she nice? Perfectly fine. She's perfectly nice. Totally nice. You know why? Because there were no fans to make one way or the other from being nice to me or not being nice to me. And so I guess she was just nice to me. There was no money on the line. There's no image to carefully craft. There was just a human interaction, and in that way, she was fine. I'm sure if I dug deep, there's a lot of bad stuff there, but she was a perfectly fine person. But this is what Griff does to people. You have to craft the persona that gets you paid, even if that persona is objectionably, it's just the worst. It's just the worst. You get paid to be bad. That's a bad system, I think. Yeah, God, man. The media ecosystem is, is, it's so toxic. it, 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 I'm sure if there was a camera around, she would be uh, more blunt with you. But like, totally, yeah, totally. It's it's she's just putting on a performance in that kind of a situation, you know. Like it's it just, but it does everyone a disservice when we have that kind of a scenario. Like you know, it started with Crossfire and really, well, really took off with mm. Crossfire. Like they're not there to debate. So I was like, I don't like to talk to people from other outlets because they're not really looking for an actual conversation about things like this is. Um, What's the point? I don't want if you don't if you want to argue with me, you just kind of like resort to like bad faith attacks. It's a waste of my time. You see this kind of stuff a lot with like YouTube uh, debates. Not really, yeah, of interest to me. I think there's a bunch of people who like to like debate right wingers and alt right people on YouTube. It's a waste of time because it's all performance. No one's gonna be like, you know what? I changed my mind at the end. It's it's a waste. It's it's a, it's an absolute waste. It's all for entertainment. I, I yeah, I couldn't agree more. I said that many times on the show. I do think there are people who really do believe that engaging in that will change minds. I know of at least one person who is actually genuine. I think that person is wrong. I don't think it has that effect. Nine out of ten people who do that, though, whether they're good or bad at it, that's a different thing. And if if you just want that entertainment, then fine, watch it. It's you know arguably as good as watching a Fast and Furious movie in terms of its effect on the country. But it is just performance, it's brand yeah. building, it's arguably clout chasing, that's all it is. Not to say that nobody's ever had their mind changed 
but it's mighty rare. And I don't think that's what most people are doing. Like if you sit down to debate with Ben Shapiro, Ben Shapiro is not honestly trying to make the country better by doing that. That's just not how that works. One of the laws of the 2020 election is that it is not an election day, it is an election week, if not an election month, and that it is going to be very exciting because while in past elections, um, the will of the people was what decided the vote. It might not go this way uh, this time. So uh, I wanna remind you of a story that we have talked about previously, but that I want to be on your radar so that the people who watch the show aren't like, you know, just so surprised by some of the things that they might try to do after the election. So one, and potentially the greasiest, even more so than trying to get the Supreme Court to shut down the mail-in ballot uh, you know, count or something like that. Would be if Trump loses states and those states decide no, he actually won, which they technically can sort of do. So the president is not directly elected by the people. The official votes are cast by electors on behalf of the voters in their states. Though states have historically chosen their electors by the popular vote, the Constitution doesn't mandate that, saying only that a state shall appoint its electors, quote, in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct. Now, despite that, Every state has allowed its voters to make the call in every election since the late 1800s. But in 2000, the Supreme Court held in Bush v. Gore that the states, quote, can take back the power to appoint electors. So the plan that some on the right have begun to tell reporters is that after the national election, the Trump campaign would cry foul about rampant fraud and demand that state legislatures ignore the ballot tabulations and choose their electors directly. If the campaign can sustain doubt or confusion about the ballot count, legislators will feel more and more pressure to take up the responsibility before the December 8th deadline when electors names are sent to Congress for verification. So there is, according to the Atlantic, there's a Trump campaign legal advisor that said that this effort would be framed as protecting the will of the people. They'd effectively be saying, we can't trust the vote. So we're gonna tell you how the people would have voted if it wasn't totally fraudulent, wink, wink, fraudulent. So Jordan, um, we have more details. We've covered them on the show before. This is one of the things I'm worried about. Does, does this strike you as a possibility or do you think that sure technically it could happen, but they would never actually try to do that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, and I'll be, I'll just be honest, I, I'm worried, but I don't want to veer too much into, um, you know, fear uh, and kind of just like helplessness. They are absolutely trying to suppress the vote, whether that's you know the the, the decision yesterday to uh, allow the witness requirement for absentee ballots in South Carolina, Trump's yeah. deliberate call for people to show up to polling locations and be poll watchers, that kind of stuff. That is designed. It seems to be designed to create. Conflict at polling locations and mayhem. We're going to see people out there taking it upon themselves to disenfranchise voters and specifically voters of color. That is alarming. And now this is this this kind of bureaucratic bogging down the system with you know legal challenges and also now the state by state approach to recreate it seems results according to their liking. All of this together is very alarming. What I hope is turnout for, for the Democrats is so high that it completely nullifies all of this effort. The one way to beat this is with a historic turnout. Um, so I'm fearful, or I'm sorry, like I, I'm a little bit concerned, a little worried, but I don't want to just resort to hopelessness. Mm -hmm. So I hope I hope people remind themselves that turnout is is the way to defeat this. Uh, I think that you're you're totally right with your diagnosis there. I'm also glad that you mentioned that. Um, I believe it's South Carolina was the witness mm -hmm. requirement. Yeah, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because, yeah, I I sometimes get so focused on. So what are they going to try to do after the election that we yeah we can't miss that? No, they're already doing things every day. I mean, Texas decided uh, you're going to have one drop off location in every county, whether it's you know a county with three and a half people and a dog in it or one of the largest cities in the country in it. That is obviously designed to make it harder and less safe for people to actually deposit their votes. The South Carolina thing is absolutely insane. One of the worst parts of it is that many people will cast will send their ballots in not knowing that they just won't be counted because of this. 
And South Carolina, like it's probably just gonna go for Trump anyway, but it could just be really close. And in the end, like we won't even know how many votes weren't counted. That's the thing. A lot of these efforts, it's not just that they're effective in altering the vote, it's that they're sort of invisible. We know that the process is there. We don't know how many people it actually disenfranchises, which is really scary. And I and I do agree. Like if Biden wins Texas, then I don't see how you make the case that you need to override the will of the voters. On the other hand, arguably, and this is getting into maybe rampant speculation, if it is such a like wave election that he's winning states that you wouldn't expect that he should, including Texas, like do we think that Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson aren't above saying that that itself is evidence? Of fraud that a Democrat could win a state like Texas that they haven't won in decades. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I I mean, they're going to try everything know. they can. They they don't they don't care about the democratic process. These people only care about power. So yeah, I, I could absolutely see that. Yeah, but although regardless of whether that's true or not, your your point still stands. The best defense that we have available to us is to vote. To vote, to turn out, to get as many people as we can to vote, to get as many votes on our side as possible, to make it as strong a victory as is actually possible. Um, we might, in the end, have to hope that the system is strong enough to actually hold even with that. But that's what we can actually do. And we have plenty of time. It's still four, four weeks until the election. You can go to vote.org, you can go to tyt.com slash vote, find out all the information you need to, to make sure that you can vote. Those deadlines for a lot of states are getting closer though in terms of registration. So you're definitely gonna wanna do that now. I I can't imagine you haven't yet if you watch the show, cuz I harangue you about it literally every day. But Jordan's 100% right, that's what we can do, so why don't we do that? If something else happens, we'll strategize then, and we'll probably be turning to Jordan for information because he's involved with an organization that is better suited than pretty much anyone to deal with something like that. But for right now, we're not there yet. Um, so uh, I'm with you, Jordan. Um, now, that was a lot, Jordan. Thank you so much for giving us your time and helping us get through that. It's been a wild bit of time. Uh, I hope that at some point things die down a little bit so that we can play some games or something. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> I hope so too, yeah, that would be great. I hope so. Okay, well, uh, until then, uh, where can people uh, follow you? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Jordan Yule. Awesome, everyone should definitely follow Jordan. Um, I would consider it essential tweeting, especially in this time. Jordan, thank you, have a good one. Thanks. Thanks to the pace of the news in the past month or so, especially the last week, the DNC and the RNC now feel like they were a very long time ago. But some of the moments of those events are still very easy to recall. Um, particularly heartfelt moments uh, like one that you probably remember. And that was when um, Kristen Urquiza talked about the experience of tragically losing her father to COVID and talked about how her father had been a big fan of Donald Trump, had trusted him on the pandemic. Um, and I think for the many families, literally millions of families around America who have uh, dealt with COVID, um, I think that that was a very strong moment, and that's why I am, um, you know, quite thrilled, despite the, the tragic nature of it, um, that Kristen Arquisa joins us on the Damage Report now. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Um, for those who might not have seen your appearance at the DNC, can you, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the experience of your family? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my dad, as you mentioned, was a lifelong Republican and a Trump supporter. He lived in Arizona, which reopened on May 15th. Um, at that same time, the president, his first public appearance after his own quarantine was in Arizona. And uh, both the president and the governor uh, went on a PR spree to basically say that we were on the other side of the pandemic, that if you didn't have an underlying health condition, that it was safe to resume normal activities. Um, my dad had no reason not to believe them. Uh, so he decided to meet up with some friends and start to resume life as normal. Uh, within a couple of weeks of that uh, reopening, my dad woke up with a fever, chills, fatigue, and 19 days later, he passed away from COVID. He was an otherwise healthy, exuberant guy who did not deserve to die alone in a hospital. No, no, certainly not. Um... 
And we know that your your father's reaction, you know, seeing the government tell them, no, it's it's okay to go back about your life. Many people are going to trust that. Did did you speak with your father about this? Did he like vocalize at all about his thought process um, around resuming normal activities? Yeah, my dad and I were in constant conversation from uh, March onwards about the pandemic, what we should be doing to minimize risk and approaching it as a family. Um, but when the states started to reopen, those conversations became losing battles for me. My dad, his response to my concerns about him um, going out and meeting up with people was met with, Kristen, I I hear you, I know you love me, but honestly, why would the president, why would the governor be saying it is safe when it is not safe? I could not compete with the megaphone coming out of the White House that's reiterated on Fox News and uh, through governor's mansions like Doug Ducey and also on social media channels. And I lost that messaging battle as I'm sure, and I have met others who have experienced exactly the same as me. Yeah, it's really hard to stand up against all of that. Now, um, you know, the the federal re Republicans at the national level, state level, the media just and and the and Fox News, of course, has they have doctors that they bring on um, to a very particular view of what the pandemic is like. How can any one family hope to to overcome that? Um, now, you, uh, as a result of your experience, you've started an organization. Can you tell us about that? Yes, a few days after my dad passed, I launched a nonprofit called Marked by COVID. My dad's name was Mark, so it's a little bit of a nod to him, but it's also a campaign and platform to represent not only folks who have lost a loved one, but folks who are survivors, frontline and essential workers and their rights and needs. And what we're doing is helping to connect people help folks, uh, help raise people's voices, and also demand accountability through a variety of actions, uh, uh, both in, in uh, both online and also hosting vigils, letter writing campaigns, to really draw attention to the failed response of this president um, and his Republican enablers to humanize these numbers. 210,000 people, people have died at the hands of this president. And he continues to treat this virus as if it's just going to go away and that those people were nobodies. We are here to stand witness to the thousands of somebodies whose lives have been lost. You know, um, so you talked about a few different things there, sort of drawing attention to it, making sure that people know about what's been done and what hasn't been done. You know, obviously, ideally, the government would change, that it would start to learn from its response or lack of response. Um, do, do you have any faith that Donald Trump, that anything could happen that would cause him to take it more seriously and, and actually do something, a national mandate, even just telling his followers to wear masks or anything like that? I mean, we are calling on a coordinated, data-driven national response to this pandemic. That is what experts say is needed to really uh, meet and commiserate with the, the challenge that we're up against. I do not trust that Donald Trump has anyone's interest only that other than his own, his own interest. And right now, at least through November, that is gonna be 1000% focused on his reelection. His reelection um, campaign efforts are going to rely on these very extreme right wing uh, radical folks who don't want to wear masks to reelect him and intimidate voters all across the country. So unfortunately, no, I do not believe that this president and uh, has the country's best interest in mind. He has his own self-interest and his own pocketbook uh, in wow. mind. Mm. Well, well, let's talk about one form of his self-interest. So um, he, I've said a million times on the show, doesn't seem to care if, you know, hundreds of thousands of additional people, millions of additional people get COVID, um, except possibly one himself, and he got it. So that has obviously, you know, affected the country at large, but it affected you personally because you were actually at the debate last week when he apparently might have had COVID. 
I know, right? Um, it just gets worse. I was at the debate, a guest of Vice President Biden's. I agreed to um, take that invitation underneath the under the very clear understanding that every single person in that room would have just had a COVID negative test. I and everybody else managed to get there in time to go through the process to get my test, get my test results, uh, put on my mask and enter into the space together. Um, when I later saw the Trump, in, uh, the Trump family entering in without masks on, it enraged me. It made me feel a little scared, but then I thought, well, at the very least, we've all gotten negative tests, so I think that this is just a stunt for them to continue to downplay the efficacy of mask wearing. But then to learn a couple of days later that they arrived so late that they couldn't have tests, it just was a blow to my already scarred heart, not only because of my own health, but because of the health of every single person in that room from congressional members to janitors and workers, this is out. Uh, yeah. This man has no regard for human life. And but but thankfully, um, since then you have been tested, and you thankfully have come out. You you do not have uh, COVID, correct? Yes, I've tested negative. Um, but even with that, I'm I am adhering to a self quarantine. There are such things as as false false negatives, and I couldn't imagine potentially being um, a carrier that passes this on to somebody else. So I am continuing to quarantine at home until that 14 days has gone by. Yeah. You know, you, you mentioned, obviously, so you, you appeared at the DNC. You were a guest of Joe Biden for this event. I, look, I honestly have no idea to what extent you've, you've spoken with uh, either the, the nominee or his team. Um, do you have reason to believe if November goes, you know, a, a particular way and Trump uh, transitions out, um, what do you think that could mean for the country's response to the pandemic, which in all likelihood is still going to be raging, you know, come inauguration? Yeah, absolutely. The pandemic will still be raging, unfortunately, come January. Um, you know, I've been in some contact with the Biden campaign um, and we at Mark by COVID are developing a policy platform um, uh, that has a real focus not only on the response and the recovery, but also the resiliency and restitution pieces to ensure that we do not end up in this situation again. And also to ensure that the families who have been most impacted, that their needs, their long-term needs are centered. Um, and I look forward to being able to, uh, you know, advocate and work with an administration that has a care and a concern for, um, uh, for public health. Uh, that being said, obviously, uh, the Democrats and the Biden, uh, Biden campaign is, is not a panacea to all of our, our issues and problems, but I am very confident on day one, uh, Joe Biden will enter into office and prioritize COVID response and recovery. And that's exactly what we need in order to start to even imagine getting on uh, back on an economic uh, track. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, but between now and then, and especially between now and the election, when we'll find out which way it's going to go, um, if somebody's watching this and they want to do something, um, what, what can they do? Where, where can they find out more information about uh, Marked by COVID? Yes, please um, join us on one of our social media platforms. So we're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at Marked by COVID. We're also on our website, uh, markedbycovid.com, where you can, uh, if you've if you yourself have been marked by COVID, please reach out. We want to connect with you, uh, connect you to others and help you tell your story. And then there's also ways to uh, donate, get involved on our email list and stay in touch. Awesome. Well, look, we really appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, the stakes literally couldn't be any higher. And um, you know, thank you for joining us uh, on the show today, Kristen. We really appreciate it. I really it. appreciate being here. Thank you so much for uh, telling my story. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.